officially get started and um, let's do the recording. So hi everybody, welcome to class today. Today's class is on a really interesting topic. We're gonna look at the First Amendment again this week, but we're gonna dive deeply into the religion clauses. And I say clauses because there are two. My name is Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm here to help. So as we go through classes, I'm gonna be bugging our top scholar, Tom Donnelly, all these times asking questions, but I want you to bug them too. So anytime you wanna hear more or dig into that deeper, Tom, or I don't know what that word means, all those questions are great and we love to hear them. So make sure you put them in the chat. Now, Tom Donnelly is one of our top scholars at the National Constitution Center, and he's gonna guide us through the religion clauses today. Tom, you wanna say hi to everybody and get us started? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here. And just to reiterate what Curry said, ask questions. We want to be as responsive as possible to what interests you. Um, where should we start, Curry? What do you think? Well, I have so many, so many questions. And I, we, put the, we put all the questions down. But really, it starts with this. This is kind of like the way our brains see the First Amendment, that the First Amendment is this big idea, and that there's different parts to it. And today, we're going to focus on that kind of center area, that center column of religion, establishment, and free exercise, and what the heck, which is number one question, what does establishing establishment clause and what does free exercise clause say and mean to us every day? But Tom, before we dive into that, why are all these together and what is the real kind of job and goal of the First Amendment? Why did they put something, I mean, speech and religion, I don't know if I would connect those dots assembly and petition to religion. I don't know if I'd put them all together. So why did they? Yeah, they're, they're, they're obviously among our core fundamental rights. And I think the, the way I look at it and what, what I think unifies it is that they all are central to our freedom of conscience and in different ways, they're, 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 they're interrelated. So with, you know, with religion, so with the establishment clause and free exercise clause, we really get that, that freedom of belief to believe in God, not believe in God, and the government will not prescribe a particular religion for us or force us to think a certain thing. And so it's sort of what happens internally in our brain and in our hearts. And then with the other rights that we see in the First Amendment, they're absolutely essential to being able to communicate those beliefs to other people through speech, through press. So, you know, newspapers, it's pamphlets, et cetera. Assembling, getting, gathering together with people who think like we do, um, to try to convince other people that we have, we have it right and that they might benefit from what we know and from what we believe. And similarly with petition, to have that right to, even if, we're, even if we can't vote, even if we're a, a, you know, a, a political minority, or like in early America, if you're, you're, you're a woman and cannot vote or an African-American or cannot vote, you still have this right to petition your government saying, this is what I believe, this is what I think, this is what I think you're doing wrong. And so we get then together with this, the religion clauses, the, the freedom of belief, and then speech, press, assembly, petition, our freedom to communicate that to other people. And from, for, in so many cases, it's most important precisely for those who don't have power, for those that aren't the political majority, for those that are dissenters along religious and political dimensions. Oh, and I love that. So it's the freedom to express what we think, what we believe, what we want to do, and who we want to be with. And that gives us power, even if we're a group that doesn't have the right to vote, like probably most of our students on today. And so they Absolutely. still have all these rights. And so they, get, they can still, an eight-year-old can petition the government. A 10-year-old can gather in a group. Uh, you know, a 17-year-old can have the ability to speech and press, and it doesn't stop. Love that idea. So now we're going to narrow in on the religion clauses. There's two parts. And you know, here's the First Amendment for you, the establishment of a religion and the free exercise. So when we look at the First Amendment, who is it talking to and what is it really saying about government and religion and connecting those dots or separating those two? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the big idea here is that this is how within the Bill of Rights we're protecting religious liberty and freedom of belief. That's sort of, that's what unifies the two clauses, but the, each of the clauses get to that in a different way. And we'll, as we'll talk about it, Curry, part of it is driven, we'll wanna understand the history of why you might have two different clauses. And then we also wanna see how are those clauses applied today in different contexts. But you know, sort of what are those clauses getting at? Well, the establishment clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. 
really means that, that go the government, and especially at, at the founding Congress, the national government, doesn't have the power to establish a religion. And so it's, it's maintaining, it's basically saying national government at the founding, you have, you, you need to get out of the religion business. That's effectively what we're saying there. And then later, once we apply that provision to the states through incorporation of the 14th Amendment, we see that applied more broadly to both the national government and the states. So that's the Establishment Clause. Again, we'll talk about the history and its cases after that, but that's just a little framing. The Free Exercise Clause really goes to that freedom of belief I, I talked about at the beginning, which is this idea that the government can't punish you for believing in God, believing in a particular God, being part of a particular faith, or having no faith at all or no belief in God. And so this is really the roots. If, if we're thinking about like, what is if going back to the colonial America and the founding itself, what is America founded on in part? It's founded on religious diversity and a belief in religious liberty. And so that's embodied here in this free exercise clause. Of course, in colonial Americans had a different conception of religious liberty than we do today. But that belief in a freedom of conscience and religious liberty is something that flowed from the earliest times when, Ameri when, when uh, Europeans came to America all the way up, up into the founding. So got it. So establishes the government cannot be, and I love the way you said it, the government's not allowed to be in the business of picking a religion, favoring one over another. So get out of it, government. And two, that you have the right and the freedom to be in the, have a, what is the line? To believe in whatever you choose or not. You know, that, that's really the way it's set up. And this is put into the constitution because of the lived experience of the colonists and the founding generation. They came from a government that did tell them what church was better than the other and tried to control the, what they believed and how they exercised their religion. Do you wanna dive into like, you know, what was going on in the colonies before the constitution? So why it was so important for them to put it in there? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, the, it, 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 to a certain extent, you know, Europeans coming to America, so many of them were driven by the fact that they were treated poorly because of their religious faith. They were religious, dissenters in their own country. And so as a result of this, we have all sorts of people of different faith coming to America and creating initially a colonial America where you have religious diversity. And so you have, you know, you have Puritans in New England, you have people of the Church of England, Anglicans down in the South, you have Quakers and, and Lutherans in Pennsylvania, you have Presbyterians throughout the middle colonies, you have Jewish congregations from Newport, Rhode Island down to Savannah, Georgia. And so there's a way in which the root of America is religious diversity. But the, the other part of it, Curry, and this is where the religion clauses end up coming in, is we also have a long tradition in colonial America of government established churches. We had government established churches here. So people are leaving Europe to practice their faiths, but they're coming here and establishing governments in various colonies. They're also having an intermingling of religion and the government. And so, you know, if you're looking at what does a government established church look like? Well, you might have colonial authorities saying, you know, who the clergy could be, giving them licenses, supervising them, having laws on the books requiring you to pay taxes to churches, requiring you to attend church service. And if you're a religious dissenter, you could be told, no, we don't want that here. You know, look at Roger Williams. What did, what did the, um, the Puritan say to Roger Williams, who was, you know, an early, he was a Puritan himself, but didn't think the Puritans were Puritan enough. Uh, they said, leave the colony, go into the wilderness, see how you do. He founded Rhode Island, he did okay. Uh, uh, but, but, but not always the case. Not all the ones that got kicked out did so no, well. No, absolutely. And much said, yeah, no, there's, there's plenty of examples where that wasn't the case. And you have to remember, it's, it, we're dealing with uh, an environment where, you know, if you're being banished into the wilderness in New England, it's cold. You need food. Like, it's, it's a really dangerous thing. So anyway, this is to say, we, on the one hand, religious diversity uh, and, and, and really rejecting the persecution that, that many groups were having in Europe, but also an intermingling of church and state in some of these colonies. And so we see sort of combined, uh, you know, both, both some religious tolerance, but also accommodation of church and state. We also see some colonies, I just wanna suggest, not all colonies had established churches. So, you know, especially the middle colonies, you know, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, um, they, there was greater religious tolerance there. But even then, 11 of the 13 states had some sort of religious test for people to hold public office. And so within, the, you know, within, you know, early America before the Constitution, we had religious tests which said you had to be Christian or even you had to be Protestant to hold office in certain states. And so this is part of the lived experience when we're putting together the First Amendment, we really have, there, there are two things that by the time we get to the founding generation, 
that are going in, that, that, that are in people's mind. One is, you know, we're, we're creating this new and powerful national government. We surely do not want that national government to have the power to establish a church nationally. We don't want that. We don't want the national government in that business. We don't want it to be like the Church of England forcing everyone in the United States, a very large new country to conform with that. Um, but remember, Curry, in this context, this isn't a triumph for religious liberty necessarily. This is more about federalism and state power and what states can do versus what the national government can do rather than broad tolerance. So the, the, the amendment itself says Congress shall make no law. So Congress can't establish a national church, but states still can even after the but Bill Rhode of Rights. Rhode Island can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, 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 so, and exactly. So, so you know, with, even with the First Amendment passed, it only applies to the national government. And so it's getting the national government out of that business, states can still do it. Furthermore, the national government does not have the power under the new constitution to tell states to cut it out. They can't tell states don't establish a church. And so that, it, it'll be the forces of politics at the state level that get rid of government established churches where they still existed. And by the 1830s, we have no government established churches anymore. The flip side then Curry is we have this free exercise clause. So we have establishment really going at the founding to that idea of establishing a church um, uh, whereas free exercise is then going to that freedom of belief. And so by the time we're putting the First Amendment in place, one of the most prominent provisions you see in state constitutions throughout the United States are provisions dealing with freedom of conscience and religious liberty. And so at this point in time, there is some disagreement as to how broad religious tolerance needs to go. But nevertheless, there is a sense that we want a core protection for the freedom of conscience within the Constitution itself. And so we get the free exercise clause. And again, it, it ends up embodying this big idea that you have freedom to believe as you wish or not, and the government cannot punish you. At the founding, that means the national government can't punish you. But as we get into the 20th century and we apply these, these protections to state abuses, it means that the states can't do that either. And so that's a bit about the, the history and the, and the, and the structure. Uh, where, where would you like to go from here, Curry? Yeah, I just want to kind of wrap this up because I think it's kind of fascinating that these are, you know, people coming to, to America, coming to the, what they deem the new world. And they're saying the national government can't touch our local area religions, but we can establish. So it's kind of a mix between looking for freedom, but also then also suppressing other people's freedoms. Because I, I bring up like Anne Hutchinson, mm -hmm. um, who was in one of the colonies and she was saying like, oh no, no, I don't think the church people should tell you what to do. I think we should as a community should have voice and agency, including women. And they kicked her out too. They're like, nope, go to a different colony. You're not for here. This is not how our religion is set up. So it's this kind of mix between the two, but still trying to embed in there people do have freedom to believe as they wish. Um, so I think that's really kind of important that it's not just a, we learned our lesson, we came over here and we did everything completely differently. They kind of didn't, they only did some of it differently. Well, well and the last thing I'll note, Curry, is that certainly by the time, there, you have to remember the length of time between the Puritans arriving and the revolution is a really, really long period of time. Yeah. And so we do see as we get towards the revolution and towards the constitution, an increase in a belief in individual rights, in freedom of conscience. I mean, if you're looking at key founders who, who believe this, like look at James Madison in Virginia. You know, he is, you know, he's there, he's a state legislator in Virginia. He's an ally of, of Thomas Jefferson, obviously. And the two of them, Virginia itself having a, a strong Anglican church there, Church of England presence, but they are there speaking out for religious dissenters, the Baptists, for instance, a dissenting Protestant group. And what they're doing is they're fighting against laws in Virginia trying to force the Baptists to pay taxes that'll go to the Anglican church. And so you see even there, the, 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 the you know, a fight, a fight for religious liberty there, or once George Washington is, is president, you see him with very, very famous letters mm -hmm. to different, um, you know, different religious groups, including Jewish congregations and the Quakers, the, those groups saying, you know, will America stand by freedom of conscience, religious liberty or not? And Washington saying, of course, you're loyal Americans. And we will honor religious tolerance and, you know, honor our differences and the, and the virtues of those differences. And so, you know, there's a way in which by the time you're at the founding, you're not in Puritan New England anymore. But all of this is part of the inheritance we have as we think about the religion clauses today. And also understanding that like these changes in how government and religion works are iterative. They change over time. And it almost begins with like, okay, we're going to start with the national government. 
cannot set up or favor one religion over the other. So to the next point of what are we going to, where are we going next? Break down for us, Tom, what does it mean to establish? Because I mean, sometimes you can kind of think it's really easy. Like, okay, so the national government can't invent a church and say we're all going to be in that church. That's establishing a religion. But are there, is there like little bits to that that can happen that can show establishment, like nuance around that? And I know we like to talk a lot about the separation between church and state, but we know this wall is a little porous. So it's not such a clean cleave in between the two. So kind of what does, like if I, today, what would establishing a religion look like other than the government making a church or favoring one church over the other? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It's true. It's like, we have no national church. We don't have state churches. So what's this thing? What's this thing here for now? Um, and, you know, the, the one thing, to, you know, one thing to note is like there are, you know, clear examples where a lot of people would agree this is, you know, this would be a core violation of the Establishment Clause. Very simple things like establishing a church would be one. If the, you know, if government was in the, in the, in the practice of like telling religions what to believe, that would be another one. If the government was, you know, in their laws favoring one religion over another without a good non-religious reason, that would violate the Establishment Clause. And people broadly would say that, but you're right, Curry, this is an area that, you know, it, it is one of the most highly debated today, the mm -hmm. Establishment Clause, it divides the justices. And so it can often result in some really tough line drawing once you're past the really clear example of a, of a, a nationally or a state established church. So wh what has the court done? Well, one, we should all, we should know, um, you know, the, the, the classic test, which is called the Lemon Test after Lemon versus Kurtzman is the name of the case. And what the court is asking here is, you know, what does, um, you know, how do, you know, what, do, what does a law have to be able to do in order to pass muster in order to make sure that it's not violating the establishment clause? Well, here, 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 I mean, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty um, open-ended test, but it's, it, it's commonsensical. This, the, the law actually has to have a non-religious, legitimate non-religious purpose. It has to do something that's non-religious, um, you know, whether it's to keep people safe or whatever, a normal government interest, uh, normal, you know, non-religious interest. That has to be one thing, a secular purpose. You know, the next is a principle or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. And then finally, there can't be an excessive entanglement of the government and religion. And so here, you know, it really is the courts at least initially asking, is there a non-religious reason for this? And does the law itself seem to be combining religion with state, uh, it, it, with the government in, um, you know, a problematic way going forward? Now you could already, as you're thinking about this, this, re this, is, this requires difficult line drawing that will often turn on the specifics of the legal issue and what's actually going on in a case. But if you're thinking about the Establishment Clause, there's really three areas of law we want to tick through where we have ongoing controversy. Should we just sort of tick through that? Yeah, quickly? I was going to say, let's look at like cases. Like, so, okay, so aid to religious education. So real like hard example of that. I'm the government and I give the, um, the Jewish school in my neighborhood funding to support buses to take their students to school or to football games or to whatever. Does that mean that as a government agency, I'm favoring that religion? Um, does that mean I'm when giving aid to a school that that is kind of excessive entanglement, it's crossing the line? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that, that is a, that, that's a classic example of these sorts of cases, government funding cases to religious institutions. What I want to note is there are two, there's a debate over this. There's a deba de debate between, between judges and scholars, and there are two big positions that are frequently taken. One is the argument that what the Constitution requires, what the Establishment Clause requires, is neutrality. So you need to treat non-religious institutions the same way you treat religious institutions. You can't discriminate against one or the other. And so this approach would allow for relatively more taxpayer money to go to religious institutions. The other approach is more of a clear rule. And, and it's one that really is trying to draw a line to say there, there are going to be a lot of instances in which we're not going to provide taxpayer funding to religious institutions, even if we do to non-religious. And so they, you, there you have relatively less money flowing to religious institutions. And the court itself has gone back and forth as to which approach it's taken over time. And so your case would come out differently maybe under those different approaches. So, you know, initially, if you're looking at like the 1940s, 50s, the court took the first approach saying, you know, rough, rough neutrality, we're gonna allow some taxpayer funding to go to religious institutions as long as it's really for a non-religious purpose. Then in the, in the uh, sort of like in the, 80s, the 70s and 80s, there was a push more towards creating a, a separation 
um, which would then allow you to give some money to non-religious institutions, but, uh, uh, but not to religious institutions. Because the, 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 the thought here is you want a, a clear and bright rule because you don't want the money you're, you're having, even if it's not going directly to religious purposes to you know, incidentally flow to the religious mission of religious institutions. And then finally, in more recent years, the court has taken, you know, gone back to the neutrality approach. And so rel re allowing relatively more money to flow to religious institutions. So I would say under current law, under a case like Trinity Lutheran from a couple of years ago, um, you know, probably that funding structure would be fine, but you would probably see some dissent by at least a couple of the justices. Got it. And we're going to tick through these really quickly because yeah. we got to get the free exercise. But I think um, one of the ones that students have seen before are, is school prayer. So where do we fall on school prayer? That's another kind of big area. And I'm going to pick a, like a more modern case, but this is a graduation and there was a prayer at the graduation and it's a graduation of a publicly funded school. So kind of just to lay some like foundation around it. How have they kind of balanced Prayer, because prayer feels very at a at a public school. Prayer feels very religious to me, but have they separated that out, or even add like a a prayer on a wall of a public school? And what if that's not my religion? What if that's not my belief? So how do they how do they deal with school prayer in public institutions? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Carrie. And 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 you know the 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 classic cases are from the 1960s, and these were cases where they, the court said under the establishment clause. You know, you, you can't have school prayer, even if it's voluntary, you can't have Bible reading. Um, and so this was, this was a, a really, really controversial set of decisions um, where there was a large public backlash against the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court stood by this position on the Establishment Clause. And so what you see as you get into the 1990s with Lee versus Wiseman, which, which, you, saw, which you had the picture of, of Curry, um, and a case, uh, Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe, is that even when you know, you're dealing with graduation ceremonies or you're dealing with football games in public, public schools, we're not gonna allow prayer in that setting. Um, and so the concern, what seems to be animating the court in these cases, the majority, is a concern about what you would say sort of coercion. You would say, I think that the, the general theory that's driving it is that, you know, students, um, uh, you know, the, the students are, are generally vulnerable to what's being taught in classrooms. And so we want to we want to be cautious about when we're allowing those sorts of things like prayer into the schools. And it's to be contrasted, Curry, with the courts taking a very different approach to prayer in state legislatures or town councils. So in a case, Marsh v. Chambers in the 80s and Town of Greece versus Galloway just a few years ago, the court said in that context where, you know, it's, it's largely adults around where we've been doing it for a really long period of time, prayer is okay there. So it's a very clear way in which there's an intermingling. You're allowing prayer in the setting of the government itself, but the court has said that that's okay. And so there's sort of a contrasting approach between what the court has done in schools, which again, even though, even though they, it's been consistent since the 60s in limiting school prayer, those cases still draw dissents. There's still great debate there um, versus what you see in, the, in, in state legislative and town council contexts. So a couple questions on that, and I love everybody for these questions. So um, the Cunningham class asks, what about singing religious songs in music class? It, and I have to tell you, my kids, um, their, their, their end of the year, their winter, public school winter program, they sang religious songs. And it was like a million religious songs from like every different religion, but are they allowed to do that? And then the next question um, from Iman said, what ab is it mandatory to have those prayers in legislative settings? And then thank you for asking that one. Another good one from the Cunningham Club. I knew this one was coming. In God we trust. Okay, so break those down, Tom. And I, it is, it's the difference between kids are in school, it's a public setting, and the authoritative people, the people in power have influence over the kids when they run the prayer but also what becomes tradition in a setting compared to what becomes yeah. religious. Okay, well, so break that all yeah, down. Yeah, no, those, those are yeah. great and very difficult questions. And I'll say like some of those are closer questions than what we've seen the Supreme Court do before. So it will depend on the facts. And let's just bring in the last set of Establishment Clause cases because I think this also goes to in God we trust, but there's also these set of cases where um, you know, when can there be this religious symbols on government property or, the, the, you know, when can the governments, you know, have religious things happen? These are when you have Ten Commandment displays, whether in, um, uh, you know, state grounds or in state courthouses. It's when you can have, when you've seen its nativity scenes 
in courthouses or town shopping districts. It's when you see crosses on public lands. And so the most recent case involved a very, very large cross in Maryland on public lands, which was put up to honor the, the, uh, the veterans of World War I. And the court upheld it. And I think this goes to what, how the court might approach something like in God We Trust now, is that there seems to be a majority of the court that's willing to say if something has been around for a while, and it's also how the court approached um, uh, legislative prayer, which is to say, this is a tradition we've had for a while. We don't think there's as much of a problem of coercion as what we have in the school context, so we'll permit this. But the question of like how they would approach something like religious songs in the context of a public school music class, that's hard. And the court hasn't taken one precisely like that. And you could imagine, you could imagine some justices would line up and say, we need a bright line here because we're still in the school context and this is potentially coercive. But you can imagine other justices saying, well, this looks a lot more like the religious symbol cases where what we're gonna ask is, we're gonna look at the, the totality. Are there a variety of religious songs being sung from a lot of different faiths and also songs that are non-religious um, you know, such that the question being, does this really look like the government's endorsing religion or is it just sort of honoring a lot of different traditions, some religious, some non-religious, but those are really, really hard line drawing exercises. And, wa and watching schools experiment and these is really interesting too. Okay, other clause, gonna shift gears here. Free establishment, it's free exercise clause. So you are allowed to choose whatever religion you want the government can't pick a religion for you or no religion at all. That is absolutely supposed to be your choice for free exercise. How kind of has this played out in American history and where does it get to the tricky part? Because it's not just what you believe, but it's the actions of your religion too. And I think that was like the key thing that made it all click for me. Government's not gonna go into your brain and tell you what to believe and not to believe. That's freedom of conscience, that's natural rights, but when my beliefs cause action, can the government affect those actions or control those actions in some way? So break it down for us, you have like four minutes. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, so here, here's a great statement from the court. It says that the, the, the free exercise clause embraces two concepts, freedom to believe and the freedom to act. The first is absolute, but in the nature of things, the second cannot be. So that's what you're saying, Curry. There's this contrast between religious belief and actions that you take because you believe something religiously. And so if you're looking at free exercise challenges, what do these things look like? Well, usually the way in which it works is the government, whether it's Congress or a state, is going to pass a law that applies to everyone, say like drugs, certain drugs are illegal. So that would be a, a general law, anti-drug law. And then you might have religious groups that require those drugs as part of their religious ceremonies. And so those groups come in and say, no, that law, which applies to everyone, violates my free exercise rights. You're violating the core of my religious beliefs. And so they, they, they will then ask the court to say, they may apply to everyone else, but it shouldn't apply to me. And so the court through its history has largely, there, there's, there's, a, there's a period in the 60s and 70s where the court does hear these arguments from religious dissenters and say, no, 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 there are constitutional protections in here. And so this is a case like Sherbert versus Verner, which involved um, a, a worker who um, uh, was told by her employer, you have to work on your Sabbath. So the day of rest in your religion, you have to work on it. She said, no, she quit. She applied for unemployment benefits and the state denied those benefits saying you haven't given it a good enough reason. And the court said, well, no, what you're forcing this person to do, uh, uh, Sherbert to do is, you know, choose between her job and her religion. You need a really, 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 really good reason um, before you have someone do that and uh, uh, you don't have it. And so Sherbert won this case. There's another case which we always love, Curry, of Wisconsin versus Yoder. And so this is a Wisconsin law that's requiring uh, uh, parents in Wisconsin to send their kids to school past the eighth grade. And you have, the, you have Amish families coming in saying, you cannot apply this law to us. It violates our free exercise rights. Sending our kids to public schools past the eighth grade exposes them to all sorts of worldly ideas that are against our faith and would destroy our culture. And so we should, this law should not apply to us. And the court again there said, yeah, that's right. That is a free exercise violation. And so you see in, in Yoder and in, in Sherbert, Sherbert, two examples where the court said, no, the religious dissenters win. 
But if you're looking throughout all of American constitutional history, the religious dissenters have lost a lot more than they've won in this context. And so the pattern that you'll see in a lot of these cases is there's a general law that applies to everyone. Religious dissenters come in and say that law shouldn't apply to us because of the free exercise clause. And the court will say, you haven't provided a good enough reason that law applies to you. So you saw this in the late 1800s with the Mormon church. Congress passed a law saying polygamy the, the, uh, the practice of marrying more than one person, that's illegal. The Mormons say that's, that's a key part of our faith. And so therefore you're violating our, the free, our free exercise rights. And the Supreme Court said, no, there is not a violation here. Congress has the power to outlaw polygamy. And you know, whereas you can believe anything you want, you can't, your, your, your freedom of action under your religion is not absolute. And the, the, this generally applicable law applies to you as well. Um, and then, you know, the more famous example recently from 1990 is Employment Division uh, versus Smith, uh, uh, which is, yeah, <laughs> employment, there it is. Uh, Sorry, I'm, like, I'm versus, getting there. <laughs> yeah, Employment Division versus Smith, which looks a lot like the Sherbert case we just talked about. It's Native Americans, um, they're employed, they're, they use peyote as part of a religious ceremony, and they fail a drug test and they lose their job. They apply to Oregon for unemployment benefits and Oregon denies them the unemployment benefits saying, no, no, you lost your job because you violated the drug laws. You do not get unemployment benefits. The Native Americans come in and say, look, we only use peyote because it was a key part of our religious ceremony. Our free exercise rights are violated. And the court in an opinion by Justice Antonin Scalia said, no, Native Americans, you lose. Effectively, what Scalia says is that Reynolds had it right. The Reynolds case involving the Mormons had it right. That if, the, the, if there's a law that applies generally to everyone, like a law outlawing drugs that goes to the health, safety, and welfare of the residents of, in this case, a state that's at the core of state power, um, you can't come to the courts and expect us court to use the free exercise clause to say you don't have to follow this law. Instead, if you want an exception, what you have to do is what people have done throughout American history which is go to the political process and try to get the state legislature or your local government to write in an exception for you. But the courts, we court, are not going to step in in this situation. And so this was a case that hit the constitutional law world like a thunderbolt. It was highly controversial. Congress responded with a law passed by bipartisan majorities in Congress called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, uh, which effectively what it did was it, it, it is a, it's a, a national law that allows courts to grant exceptions to religious objectors, trying to install the test that existed before Smith. Um, but, you know, it, 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 in the end, what we're seeing is a, a really, really difficult constitutional question of what do you do when the powers of the state to pass laws to protect health, safety, and welfare, like illegal drug laws, run up against the, the, the religious actions, the religious beliefs, and then actions of a religious minority. So that's, that's Smith. Do we want to do, you want, want to do the, the final case or, or, or take a beat on this? We have questions. Sure. <laughs> so um, the Caleb and the Pfeiffer family both asked the same question around the oath of office. So if the president were um, of a different religion or atheist, um, and Jenny kind of helped kind of put in the atheist there as well, would they have to say the full oath of office? In, I'm pretty sure it ends with like, so help me God. I know that they can choose whatever bounding document they want to swear upon, that it doesn't have to be the Bible. You can pick whatever you want. Washington started the tradition of the Bible, but um, so help me God, was that always in there? Because I know In God We Trust was 1950s, 40s yeah. and 50s, right? So where does that fall on? Do you have to still say the oath the same way if you're atheist? And, and under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, also the 50s. It was, it was in part, yeah. and it was part, a, part of, a product of the Cold War, no, it, yeah. the, 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 so help me God, as I recall, and, and we can double check this, I think that also comes from Washington and it's just a matter of custom. So there is an oath that's in the constitution that you would have to take, but it's not a specific religious oath. Furthermore, what's even before the Bill of Rights in Article Six of the original constitution, we have a, a, a provision in there that says you can't have religious tests for public office. Um, and so even though in, again, prior to the constitution, many states required religious tests for public office, we wrote in the Constitution even before the Bill of Rights that you couldn't have that. Um, so, yes, and that is Article Five, like you said. Article Six. Also, uh, oh, sorry, I always do that. I always drop the I there. Article <laughs> Six, and there is it. So they put that in there, but I, I think it's really important to see the difference between tradition and what's written in there, but also when traditions become 
uh, on government document go government tools like police uh, like uh, license plates and on dollars and I think it was Justice O'Connor that said um, at some point in time it becomes a gesture tradition and no longer connected to religion um, it, am I getting that right was that was her court case well, yeah, I forget. Yeah, I mean, there's that, and I think more generally, and this goes to the the uh, the, the the World War One cross case we talked about, the American Legion case, is that there does seem to be a, a, a tendency among the justices to try to say if something's a longstanding tradition that's been kind of un, unchecked over time, um, that they'll they'll generally uphold it. That's not in every case, but that there is like sort of a, a look towards tradition in some of the establishment clause cases in particular. Um, but the, the one final thing to note on free exercise, Curry, is the, the, ch the, the Church of Lakumi case, uh, mm -hmm. which is sort of the last thing. So we, we left off with Smith, so that's the case in 1990, where the court's not providing a lot of free exercise protections under the free exercise clause. But what we see in the Church of Lakumi Babaluai is the court does, just a few years later, read a really strong anti-discrimination principle into the free exercise clause. And so the court really is going to try to police uh, situations where it looks like a government is passing a law that's targeting a religion, that really is targeting often a religious minority. And so what happened in this case is members of the Santeria faith moved to a city in Florida. Um, uh, part of their religious tradition is they have animal sacrifice as part of their religious ceremonies. And so that city then, in response to the, 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 the members of the Santeria faith moving to the city, passed a new law banning animal sacrifice also, though, writing in exceptions for other animal killings, such as kosher, kosher butchering or killing animals in a non-religious context. And the question was, after Smith, do, do the Santeria, uh, people of the Santeria faith win under the free exercise clause? And they did. They won this case. Because what the court said is, well, we, we still, Smith is still good law. It's still very, it's going to be very hard for you to win a free exercise challenge if it's a law that applies to everyone. What we can do is we can look at the arguments, we can look at the law itself and look at the context. And if what we're convinced of is that this is a law that's targeting a religious minority, that's targeting a particular religion, it's, it's, then not a, it's not a law that's really designed to apply to everyone, but it's a law that's really meant to apply to them and to write their faith out of the community. And that if that's the case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, going to apply the toughest tests that we have constitutionally, and you government had better have a really, 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 really good reason to have passed the law that you did. And in this context, they didn't see a reason there. They really saw it as just discriminating against the people of the Santeria faith. And so they won. And so we see then sort of under the free exercise clause, a really strong anti-discrimination principle in there. So if you can see, if you can make some sort of claim that one religious sect is being disfavored or religions being disfavored versus non-religion, you can sometimes win. But if you're in a situation like employment division versus Smith under the free exercise clause, and it's just a general law, it's a lot harder to win. Um, and so that's kind of the dividing line in the constitutional cases. And I think that's really helpful to take away when laws are written, if they're to overarching apply to everybody, then it's going to be harder to say that it is affecting your religion. But if it's just targeting one type of religion, then, and then again, maybe not the intent, but the outcome of that law. I mean, we know that um, we're pretty sure that that Florida law was targeting that religion on purpose. Yeah. Um, but they could just intentionally just be trying to write a general law, but it affects that one religion, then it's not, it's going to have a, a harder time getting through the court. Okay, this is awesome. I think we've got a big understanding of what these clauses mean, what they meant to the founding generation, how they've kind of played out over time, and then how they're applied to the world we live in today. And I bet you nobody is going to be able to look at a dollar bill or drive down the street without noticing these things and wonder, oh, is that establishing a religion by that government on that public property? Oh, is that, you know, is that free exercise? Are they pushing that forward? So thank you so much, Tom. It was a great class. Students, awesome questions. I love how you're seeing this in real life and in real time. And, and it's a lot, it's a lot of, it depends, just like every constitutional question really is. No, that, that's right, Curry. And the last thing I'll notice, like you'll also see it as you see constitutional challenges to various orders having to do with coronavirus. A lot of those will involve mm -hmm. religious challenges. And so keep this, keep this uh, constitutional structure that we've talked about in mind as you're reading those stories too. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Have a great day, everybody. I'm glad to have you all in class. Thank you, everyone.